WPA3 is a brand new Wi-Fi standard that was set to end Wi-Fi hacking forever. It was announced just this time last year. Our current Wi-Fi standard, WPA2, has been around for over a decade now and has enormous problems with it. Just search WPA2 hack on YouTube and you'll find a wealth of issues. From the recent crack issue, to the four-way handshake cracking issue, to the authing, it's about time we got something new. Enter WPA3. In a previous video, I talked about how this new standard was set to kill a load of vulnerabilities that plague WPA2. Alas, it looks like I spoke too soon. Maltronics.com is where you can find the latest of hacker hardware, from Wi-Fi deauthors to Malduino keystroke injectors, Wi-Fi keyloggers, and USB protectors. It is run by myself, so do give it two minutes of your time. You're guaranteed to like our tech. Maltronics.com. Link is in the description. So, WPA3, how the mighty have fallen. Remember Crack? The nail in the coffin for WPA2 security. Well, the same guy who exposed that, whose name I still can't pronounce, Matty Van Hueth, along with his contemporaries, is at the center of discovering all these new flaws in WPA3, which is just being rolled out. They call this pack of vulnerabilities Dragonblood, since WPA3's flagship feature is called the Dragonfly Key Exchange System. So let's dig in. WPA3 was initially praised for ending the authentication attacks, essentially a vulnerability which exists now in WPA2 and I've talked a lot about on this channel. It basically allows attackers to kick people off a Wi-Fi network, regardless of whether the attacker had access to the network or not. Well, it would seem that another denial of service vulnerability has been unintentionally created in WPA3. Whilst WPA3 introduces new and improved security features, these security features can be very computationally expensive, which just means that they need a lot of processing power to implement. Now, this might look complicated, but it's how a WPA3 connection is established. It just shows the messages exchanged between a client and an access point. If we look at this top section, you will see these auth commit messages. To put it simply, they are very hard, very computationally expensive for a router to deal with, which shouldn't normally be an issue. Actually, it's a very good sign of a strong cryptographic algorithm. However, if you have an attacker who spoofs these frames, it can really overwhelm an access point to the point where the access point just nopes out and crashes. This is pretty dire, seeing as most hardware can only deal with 16 of these commit frames per second, so it's real straightforward to BTFO a router. Two of the other vulnerabilities discovered are known as side channel attacks. Now, a side channel attack isn't necessarily a vulnerability in the maths and algorithms of WPA3 itself, but rather a vulnerability in how something, in this case WPA3, is implemented. Firstly, we've got a timing based side channel attack. Remember those commit frames that are pretty computationally expensive and take some time to process? Well, Apparently, it's possible to time just how long it takes for an access point to respond to these frames. The amount of time it takes may actually leak information about the password itself. Though this only affects some of the cryptographic methods that WPA3 access points use. However, information leaked can be used to perform a dictionary attack. The other side's channel attack is cache-based. Now, now, this is slightly different. When a phone or computer is constructing one of these commit frames to send to a router, it's possible to discover information about the password if you're observing memory patterns on the device itself. Now, that might seem technical and difficult, though it is possible if an attacker is controlling any application on a victim device. So a rogue app could spell disaster. Even worse, it's possible that just by running JavaScript in a web browser, you are leaving the door open to this vulnerability. By observing these memory access patterns associated with a password, it's possible to run a dictionary attack until you get the same sequence of memory patterns, and thus revealing the password. Oopsie. Now, one of the main vulnerabilities discovered by the researchers is a downgrade attack. You see, the architects of WPA3 of course want it to be backwards compatible. You don't want to buy a brand new router tomorrow and discover it won't work with your phone you bought last week. So WPA3 routers also support WPA2. Seems sensible enough. Though the issue is an attacker can set up a rogue access point and force clients that support WPA3 into connecting using WPA2. 
you can capture this partial handshake and use it to perform a dictionary attack, leaving us in the same boat as if we just stuck with WPA2 all along. The second downgrade attack relies on the fact that WPA3 supports multiple cryptographic standards that vary in strength. It's possible for an attacker to impersonate an access point and trick a user's device into using a less secure cryptographic method, and hence again dramatically increasing the likelihood of cracking a password. Now this might all seem pretty bad, but there's more. The researchers have a trump card a vulnerability that affects the Dragonfly key exchange system itself. This is a pretty big deal, though as far as I can tell, they haven't made any information about this public just yet, as the patching process is still in progress. All these vulnerabilities were disclosed in the proper way to the Wi-Fi Alliance and vendors in advance of them being made public. You should of course update all your devices, blah blah blah, Though the problem with the Wi-Fi Alliance, which is the organization that comes up with these Wi-Fi standards, is that they do it in a very closed off, secretive way. The researchers did note that these attacks could have been avoided if the Wi-Fi Alliance created the WPA3 certification in a more open manner. Luckily though, since WPA3 is only just starting to be rolled out, there aren't that many devices in the wild just yet. So after these have all been patched, it should be plain sailing. Un until something new comes along. This video was made possible by PCBWay. If you're ever in need of PCB fabrication or assembly, PCBWay.com is the place to go. I've been using them for the past couple of years for Malduino PCBs, and I highly recommend them. They're currently celebrating their fifth anniversary, which means coupons galore, surprises, and lucky draws. Check them out in the description, PCBWay.com. So what do you guys think of this whole spectacle? If you're technically inclined and want to try and replicate some of these attacks, the researchers have released a set of tools that can help you do just that. I'll make sure to link those in the description. I love engaging with you guys on Twitter and Instagram, so let me know what you think of this video over there, if not in the comments. Remember to hit that notification bell, and as always, thanks for watching. Have a good one.